Before we get started, Foreign Policy is hosting its annual Her Power Summit on April 18th in Washington, D.C. I'll be doing two live interviews there, including with the Deputy Secretary General of the U.N. So if you want to join us at the Her Power Summit in D.C., just email us at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com. On today's episode of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, a podcast from Foreign Policy, we cover the state of girls' education. There's actually a lot to celebrate. Around the world, there's many more girls in school than two decades ago, and they're much more connected to the internet. But there are still big barriers, especially in developing countries. Education is not an expenditure. It's an investment, right? When you're able to come with the critical data and show, listen, $30, $30, this is the impact on each girl. You know, I think that has been very critical and useful. That's Julia Mabe, team lead with the Global Partnership for Education. That's an NGO dedicated to advocating for increased financial support for education in lower income countries. She leads efforts to mobilize political support at the highest level for education, including from heads of state. We should also mention that Global Partnership for Education is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which helps fund this podcast. Before her current role, Julie Imabe was the Kenyan president's gender advisor, where she focused a lot on girls' education. It's something she's been thinking about almost her entire life. I'm, you know, Kenyan girl, born and raised in Kenya, and... You know, you start off with your friends, you play, you go to school, and then you get to age 13. And it almost feels like one of you is lucky to go to school and have education, and then others are not as lucky. And at 13, 14, 15, seeing my friends who are really close to me, instead of going to school or being married off, some would, you know, just drop off beyond just a teenage marriage. But, you know, you have societies where there's female genital mutilation and stuff like that, that you kind of get them, you're like, why? What is it that makes me so special that I'm able to go one path and they're not? So I think that's where that sparked my interest in being able to be like, okay, there must be something here. There must be some another way around it. Mm. Julie, you and I met at Her Power. It's a summit held in Washington, D.C. that Foreign Policy hosts twice a year. And we had such a great conversation. We wanted you back to sort of go into deeper some of the things we talked about. I want to spend some time celebrating some of the really positive education developments in Africa. A lot more girls are in school than two decades ago. Tell me what led to this increase. We have a lot of strong African women, you know, a lot of strong African women around the world doing amazing things. And I think with that also come them advocating for other girls or advocating for more opportunities and equal advancement and equal access to basic rights, right? And I think as that has been, you know, the drum beats have been going, the noise around the world, Africans saying, you know, we, we want to rise, we want to do more for ourselves, for our continent, for our girls and our communities and representation, you know, seeing others who are able to do it. And you're like, you know what, I can do it too. But a lot of the efforts have been very targeted. I think sometimes the danger is, even when you talk about progress, there's danger in relying on the average. There's, you know, if I say to you, 72% in, in country X have gained gender parity, you know, it's you're like, yeah, it's above half. So 72 sounds fine. But then there is, you know, you have to segregate it between urban and rural. And so the urban could be doing better, but then there's always the out of school, out of the marginalized. And that's, that's the key population that we still need to look at. So I think having that targeted approach has also added to the progress. So really knowing who the audience of girls are, really researching them, understanding uh, the data behind them can really be transformative in getting them educated and up off their feet. Yes. Whether or not a girl completes her education really depends on on where she lives, right? So, you know, statistics that say one out of every three girls in sub-Saharan Africa and one every, out of every 14 in South Asia, right? And one in every 12 girls in Middle East are out of school. So those are real data. Um, and, you know, like I said, the social norms impact their likelihood of completing school. There's still, Julie, a long way to ensure that all girls get the education they deserve. What do you think are the biggest challenges right now and how are you working to address them? Child marriage is one, I'd say, is a significant cause of girls dropping out of school. 
I think data, the recent data is saying estimated 640 million girls and women are married at childhood and nearly half of child brides live in South Asia. I think that's about, they're saying that the latest data is at 45% and the next largest is over 20% in sub-Saharan Africa. And then you have conflict and emergencies. I mean, what we are seeing now across different contexts, you know, they're highly detrimental to gender equality and access to education. And when it's generational, right, it's even harder, right? When you don't have an educated mother and, you know, they're not able to see or they're not being, there's no advocacy efforts to help us see that, you know, uh, you can opt to send your child to school and keep them in school. And these are the benefits. Those are also detrimental. So having a way of working across the different entry points is, you know, it's not a one size fit all. It's not, a, there's no silver bullet to this thing. You have to sort of look at it across and find some key entry points that work together and highlighting what really works well for girls. How has COVID affected this? COVID, it felt like two years, but what we are finding is it really took girls back by over a decade, right? Where you had- Yeah. Wow, a decade. That's a lot of time to be having the wheels turn back. When you have girls who have, you know, gotten into school, um, gotten through their basic education, getting into teenagehood, and then COVID, you know, what happens is a lot of girls are at that point and the desperation and what was going, you know, economically, a lot of families were like, okay, this is for, for many families, like, you know, this is the only option we have, either marry them off and have, you know, some income for the family. So that, we saw a lot of that. And then the gender-based violence side of things, right? That was also, there was an increase to that. I don't think the world has sort of got yet how bad it has been and what the reverse gains were. And we are moving on. Okay, life is going on and we are moving on. And so we are seeing a lot of girls continuing to fall through the cracks after that. But having said that, you know, I'm encouraged to see very many initiatives to kind of sort of look at the data, especially, and find, you know, where, again, what is where geographically, who are most affected and what can we do to try accelerate the gains for girls. You've written that teachers can play a crucial role in promoting gender equality. Can you tell us a little more about that? I think we all have a teacher story, right? We all have a story of a teacher that really changed your life because I think teachers have a way of seeing. They have a way of seeing, you know, a teacher. You go to school. I get calls from my school that, you know, your son doesn't look himself today. Is everything okay? And when you think of gender-based violence, it's not, you wouldn't, probably wouldn't have the physical side of it, but, you know, teachers can sort of be able to see that. They're able to be like, okay, this child has missed. They've not been coming to school. They're not consistent. Something is looking off. And either help with the reporting lines or help getting them attention brought to an issue. And for many, and we saw this a lot during COVID, schools are a safe haven for many of these girls. And girls who would say, you know, I have come to school. If I'm not in school, my parents will marry me off. If I'm not in school, I am not safe because either whoever is praying over them or they're, they're just in vulnerable situations. And we know that a lot of the violence also happens at home, right? Our people who they know best. So it is that that comes out a lot. But beyond that, when you look at the judiciary system, like I said, a lot of you know the violence happens, those who are close and family members, and that's always the hardest to report. But a teacher can. A teacher can be, you know, a safe space for students to be able to sort of speak and also be part of that process, working with paralegals in terms of gathering evidence and being able to advocate for the girl and get them to safety or just justice for them as well. And you're now at the Global Partnership for Education, where you lead efforts to increase political support for education, including from heads of state. How do you do that exactly? You can have the data and you can have the policies and you can have the evidence. But at the end of the day, and for many countries, it is a politics of the game that moves things. What we rely on is, I guess, what we call our convening power and bringing people around the table, including heads of state. Number one, providing that evidence and saying this is, you know, highlighting that education is not an expenditure. It's an investment, right? And with that comes with the numbers that if you're able to educate a girl, if you're able to spend this amount of money in your country, this is what the outcomes are 
on development. But beyond that, uh, understanding that a lot of countries are very stretched financially, the fiscal spaces have continued to shrink quite a lot. And so finding some innovative financing mechanisms that work for them, and this includes, you know, a girls accelerator program or innovative financing like debt swaps for education, where you're able to speak to a government saying, okay, we understand that, you know, there's a debt to this, but if you're able to sort of work with another country and sort of have a debt swap, some of that money can go towards education programs, education programs for girls, and still have a return on your investment. So that's some of the things that we're able to do. Your organization is actually piloting this economic incentive for countries to invest more in education, which you mentioned just now, the debt swap for education. Who's involved with this and how are you seeing success with this program? I mean, we are seeing success with this program because we have a model called a multiplier and where countries are able to apply and say, okay, yeah, this is something that would be interested and get, you know, sort of match the dollar. So for one dollar, we can match it three times. How we know that it's working is because we we are always having to replenish that part of money because countries are tapping into it and initiatives are signing up from different countries and working through their education systems to be like, okay, we have a criteria, this is how it matches and having very strong monitoring system that allows that, okay, this is, we are able to track the funding, we're able to track its expenditure. And like I said, the fact that different countries are coming in to, to sort of ask for more or other countries, you know, hearing about it shows that it is working and is interest and it has results. The African Union recently declared 2024 to be the year of education. What do you think the significance is of this announcement? This is the first year that the African Union has identified a year for education. What it means is our partners and countries and groups and civil societies and you know are able to come together and say how can we have a common voice how can heads of state hear us how can they sort of prioritize education how can it move from a suggestion to it as a rule of law that as a country over 20 percent of our domestic financing should be going to education and education programs so that's really critical but being able to develop a collective roadmap helps move from sort of country by country or siloed programs, but then sort of this joint efforts. And, you know, together you run faster, you run further, you do more. And with that, it also attracts a lot of financing. Uh, And donors like, okay, yeah, this is something we want to jump into, but it has to be done well. You know, it has to be like, okay, this is the plan and this is what we see we are able to come out of it. And it was launched in Addis. It was such a good turnout and you just see the energy from all players wanting to do more. So I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Where should people be spending their money on this issue? For example, you write that governments should, quote, prioritize proven cost-effective approaches in their policy making so that it's guided by evidence. What do you find is the best evidence-based cost-effective approaches to education? A couple of things here. There's one about the volume of money, and it's not necessarily being judged or framed on how much. I mean, that's important. The volume is important. But what is also important is that it is equitable. It's reaching the most marginalized, right? The funding is reaching the most, those who need it the most. But beyond that, that it's efficient, that you're not having so many layers of what needs to be paid out before it actually reaches those who need. And that's, I think we see that a lot and that adds to wastage. So, um, you know, allocating those resources to the right place is essential. So what is essential? You know, we say focus on learning and equity that I've mentioned, targeting teachers, the kind of learning, interventions that improve school attendance is important, and also leaving no one behind and access and learning that promotes gender equality. So some of those are what we see as being cost effective and foundational learning, re- really reaching the at the earliest, you know. I think sometimes we try to get to education much later. And it's important to put it in primary school and secondary school and tertiary. But then it's very important on how that child starts. And so advancing those preschool programs, right? Um, We are seeing more getting to 10 without being able to read and write. So uh, the early learning is quite important. Julie, we've talked a lot about big trends. And I know that your organization also works with individual students on the ground. I was just wondering if you could share a story or if you have a story about a female student that's been particularly moving to you? Yeah, I can actually. 
this is you know a story that i met this girl i would like to say maybe it's been three oh, i was right in the middle of covid so it must have been three years now and i was going to a school it is in northern kenya and going to look at you know i was invited by one of the partners like you know we're doing amazing digital work it was a, a class about 30 girls most marginalized you know you could tell that they were just really from poorer backgrounds but they were on their computers they were doing whiz math they were you know with schools in the uk connecting and you could i was like wow they're really ahead you know they had the top internet they had everything i was like wow this is very impressive and then their lunch bell rang right and everyone just sat down and i asked them are you guys are you not going for lunch they were like no we don't have lunch and i just sat with them for a bit longer and they started opening up they're like well we don't have lunch but right outside the school there this border you know basically they ride bikes you know the biker men if we have sex with them they can give us like maybe you know 50 shillings like which is like 50 cents and i can use the money to buy lunch or buy sanitary pads for myself and for me that has always stuck with me sometimes we focus so much on one intervention that works and you're like you know we have the results we can know the digital skills this is what makes but then you cannot do it on its own because yes they're able to use a computer but then they're still vulnerable right they're still having unprotected sex because they're desperate they still need their sanitary pads they still need food the basics and i, I think for me it's to say as much as we're talking about education it cannot work on its own we need a sort of a multi-sector approach rather than look at girls and children with the lens of the sector like with the lens of just education we need to look at them as in their totality and their well-being are they safe are they fed are they protected you know do they have basic sanitary pads the things they need to thrive and i think you know the pain point where it pinches the most is we are not working together we are not there yet and i think when we get there when we start working more together we're maybe able to advance if we're able to reverse thing and rather than look at the sector but look at the children and their well-being and what they need i think we'll advance things a bit further and faster right julie any final thoughts we keep at it i mean the world is in a such a tight space with conflict with shrinking fiscal spaces but we cannot give up we have to just keep being on innovative finding what works keeping girls at the center but beyond that hearing them right mm. we cannot continue speaking for them they need to be on the table and if they know what works for them and we need to allow them to make those decisions and be part of the progress be part of the solutions and be part of the wins as we continue to celebrate them Before we wrap up today's show about girls education I wanted to share a bit of a conversation that I recently had with Paolo Canowendo in her early 30s she was the minister of investment trade and industry in Botswana she was the youngest cabinet minister in Botswana and one of the youngest in all of Africa. She's also an economist. Kenowendo has done a lot in her short life. I was curious about what got her first interested in being an economist. In short, it's something she did at school. <laughs> I, I am laughing because this was just the ha- happenstance, Serena. Um, it was uh, an essay competition. I was asked to write by a commerce teacher when I was 16. You have to write an essay on why do banks charge bank fees? And I wrote that essay quite reluctantly. And the prize was uh, that I get to have dinner with the bank governor and the deputy bank governor. And then, as a cherry uh, that I found out that night, was the president also showed up, who happened to be a trained economist at the time. And so everybody around the room were all economists. And so I thought, oh, if all the people that run uh, Botswana are economists, then certainly <laughs> this is something that I must study. You'll hear more about Boholo Kenowendo in next week's episode. 
And that does it for today's show. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is a production of Foreign Policy and is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs at Northwestern University. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is hosted by me, Rena Ninen. Laura Rosbrow Tellum is our senior producer. Rob Sachs, our managing director. Nicholas Petri Mitchell provided production assistance. Our thanks to you, and we'll be back in your feed next week. <laughs>